Hey guys, my name is Alex, and this is the 21st installment in my video project series, Thing Kingly Endeavors, in which I intend to read all of Stephen King's novels in chronological order and to hopefully post a video a week about them. I have not been doing that. In fact, I think it's been over a year since I posted any video to this project thing, which it, it appeared that I had abandoned, and every now and then someone would reach out on Twitter like, hey, when are you going to finish this? And I'd be like, soon. And yeah, I can't guarantee that I'm going to, like, you know, go all straight to the end starting now. There might be another long gap somewhere between here and novel, you know, 40 fuck. No, he's like on number 50, or 60 something. Today I'm going to be talking about Dolores Claiborne, which is actually a really, really good novel. And it sounds condescending to be like, oh, this is actually a good book. But as I recall, because I'm still a little dusty on the Stephen King biography stuff, I got to brush up. Stephen King had just gotten sober in the beginning of the 1990s, and there was this vibe that he was kind of losing his touch, or at least that he was kind of estranged from his former drug-addled muse. So he had, like, the big baggy monster that was Needful Things, a book that might have been too long if it was half of its current length. And then there was Gerald's Game, which was really impressive. It was a great concept. It was well executed. But that last, like, 70 pages, it was kind of weird. He went over the rails. He was trying a little too hard to sort of wrap things up. And I remember feeling about these books that were coming out in the wake of his sobriety that he was kind of making, this, in all of those books, he was making the same points again and again and again. And I thought it had something to do with, like, he was self-conscious about the fact that he wasn't, he wasn't as sharp as he was on coke or smoking. And so that insecurity about whether or not he was communicating his point effectively prompted him to just say the same thing again and again and again. And my understanding of Stephen King as a person is that he's a super approachable guy, very generous. Like, he does this thing where if you're a young, aspiring filmmaker and you want to make a short film based on one of his short stories, you just have to pay him a dollar and he'll give you the rights. So I don't think... I've never heard any account of him being menacing or intimidating or a tyrant or rude or anything like that, but I do think that at this point in the early 1990s, he was freshly sober, he had reached a point in his career where the things that he submitted to his agent or editor, publisher, or whatever, they're kind of beyond reproach. Like, I heard this anecdote about John Updike leaving a publishing house when he was in his 50s or 60s because they told him that he had to change something and you don't tell John Updike what to do. I'm sure Stephen King does not emanate that kind of persona at all, but at the publishing house, they probably have worked with a number of divas on the same level of John Updike, and so they don't want to risk alienating Stephen King, who is probably one of their most lucrative authors, because they want him to move a semicolon. So I think that in getting sober, apart from having been estranged from that druggy muse, Stephen King is now facing this problem of having to self-edit. Now, I don't know if you guys have heard the murmurs in the middle of the night, but there is this ghost from the Roman Empire who haunts the halls of Booktube, and he insists that Stephen King has never been edited, probably not at least since, like, the early 1980s, that he just submits a first draft and everyone just sort of lavishes praise on him and then they send it right out into the world unedited. I don't think that's true. I think Stephen King works really hard on this shit, and I, I think there are definitely books where he was like, fuck it, I'm just gonna get this done. But yeah, I do think there are, there are a bunch of burdens on him at this point in his career that, yeah, are, are making the books kind of muddy and shapeless and weird. Dolores Claiborne, though, is not just, like, at this point, which I think it was this came out in, like, 92, 93. Not only is it the strongest book of his post-sobriety period, but I think it's one of the probably top five books of his career up to this point. And one of the things that I think makes it so terrific is that he's employing the first person. I've known many very smart, bookish people who are, like, avid, voracious readers who, like, after knowing them for five years, they suddenly were like, What's the difference between first and third person? It's one of those things that can sort of easily slip by. So the, the, the first person is when you're telling the story from the perspective of, of the character's voice. The character saying, I do this, I do that, I went here, I went there. But yeah, I think Dolores Claiborne is King's first time using the first person narrator since Christine, the big ass book about the haunted car. And Christine was really good and I thought he used the first person voice to great effect there. It's much better with Dolores Claiborne though, frankly, because it's brief. I, this book is only slightly longer than a novella. So it, it I mean, it's extra gratifying because Apart from keeping you in the grip of suspense of trying to find out whether or not our, our protagonist, Dolores Claiborne, committed the murder of which she's accused, I don't. The book just ends pretty quickly. As you can, see, I don't know if you can really tell. It's one of it's one of those hardcovers that's like kind of slim. I keep hearing it and it's driving me crazy. My voice is cracking because last night I was supposed to get someplace at a certain time. I took two wrong turns and I kept getting ma sent on massive detours. And at one point, I yelled "fuck" so loud that I kind of like lost my voice. Now, getting back into the swing of kingly endeavors, I have to confess that when I sort of left the project hanging over a year ago, I had read the next three books. I'd read Dolores. 
Morris Claiborne had read Insomnia and Rose Matter, and I am not going to read them again. So my memory is a little foggy, but fortunately I've got notes in the covers of the books and stuff, so we'll make it do. Make it do. We will make do. We will make do. Dolores Claiborne, best as I recall, is about a woman who, who works as a live-in nurse for a very crotchety, wealthy old widow. When that old widow dies, Dolores Claiborne is accused of killing her. So the novel is set in the police station with her being interrogated by police, not just in any cops, the cops are people in her small town who she has watched grow up. So she's constantly lapsing into this, you know, maternal discourse about their families and, you know, I remember when you picked your nose and shit like that. That shit is really annoying. And it's, it's one of the, most of the book is her narrating in her wonderful main dialect just what happened in the course of her life, how, mostly how she killed her husband, and then how, many years later, she worked for this crotchety old lady. But Stephen King is... Does, has not quite mastered this trick of having the book exist not only entirely in the voice of his narrator, but in the voice of his narrator as she is telling a story while navigating a real-life situation. What that means is there are other people in the room to whom she is telling this story, but those people do not speak. We only hear Dolores Claiborne's side of everything. There is no authorial interjection, there is no interjection from the people around, it's just, it's 100% Dolores Claiborne's voice. And that's a total delight when she's just storytelling. But when she's, you know, talking to different people in the room and telling the story, like, it's totally confusing, it's totally unbelievable. Those small passages are just terrible. But the other parts are terrific. Because while she's insisting that she did not kill this woman that she was working for, she does pretty readily admit that she killed her husband like 20 years ago. That part of the story is really compelling, and it's kind of interesting because you notice trends in Stephen King's work after you've read so many of his novels consecutively, and one of them is men being violent towards women. Sometimes it's shocking and sometimes it's only alluded to, but it isn't, it isn't usually gratuitous in a way that it feels like Stephen King is celebrating this. Like, you do get a vibe here and in the previous book, Gerald's Game, and especially in one of the forthcoming novels, Dolores, um, fucking Rose Matter, that Stephen King is a feminist, but um, I, I can see how in 2018, sort of uh, a, a, a journey back through his work might, might find the depictions of domestic violence problematic. I don't know, I'd be interested to hear people's opinions about how, how this has held up. But Dolores Claiborne herself is a tremendously empowered figure. The book is an uplifting and life-affirming. It's, it's, it's all wonderful. Stephen King is not like a villainous guy. The passage of the book that's devoted to Dolores killing her husband actually is happening at the, sa on the, at the same time that in another part of that same town, Jesse, the hero of Gerald's game, is being uh, sexually assaulted by her father. You don't get a flashback towards that, but there's an eclipse going on, and it's the same eclipse that was going on in Gerald's game, and there are there are quick, vague references to a, like, like a shining-like connection between Jesse and Dolores, and I think that has something to do with the pain suffered by women at the hands of men, and how like Dolores is is now a grown woman who's like taking control of her life, she's not putting up with the shit anymore. And then on another part of town, there's a, a little girl who is being subjected to a similar kind of horrible treatment by a man who, when she's older, in Gerald's game, is gonna have a similar reaction. She too is going to kill her husband because she's not gonna put up with the shit anymore. Dolores Claiborne is absolutely a companion piece to Gerald's game. They aren't sequels or prequels, but they are sister volumes. This is the 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 dura the, t the length of this video is getting out of hand so I gotta cut this off like here. Just I'm just gonna I have to get back into the swing of like how to make videos, how to be mindful of time, how to script shit. I didn't script anything here. But yeah, we'll leave it at this. Uh, read this. If you have if you've read if you have read Dolores Claiborne and Gerald's game back to back or in a just in close enough proximity to one another that you remember sort of the little tendrils of connection. I'd like to hear your thoughts about how these two come together. I'd like to hear your thoughts about how these two novels work together, how they complement one another, and if you're maybe seeing connections that I completely missed. Like, maybe these books were kind of conceived at the same time and mapped out simultaneously so that the connections are a little more deliberate. Anyways, that's it for me. I haven't watched any of the old videos that I made because, uh, I'd rather die. So I don't remember if I had some particular kind of sign-off remark, so, um, I will just say, ah, constant reader. That was the fuck. All right, constant reader. Thanks for watching.